You're listening to the Common Descent Podcast. Hello, Will. Hello, David. And hello, Sarah. Hi, guys. Hello. And hello to all of you listeners out there. Welcome to episode 28 of the Common Descent Podcast. That's how old I is. It, sh- yeah, it is. That's a special number. <laughs> <laughs> Today, our episode topic comes requested by Dax on Facebook. Mm-hmm. We are talking about Charles Darwin. Yay! The man who famously ushered in... Uh, sort of our modern understanding of evolution, which underlies just about every episode that we talk about on this podcast. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And as you can hear, we are joined today by a very special guest, Dr. Sarah Bray. Hey, guys. Hello, Sarah. Happy to be here. Happy to have you. Thank you very much for joining us. Would you like to introduce yourself briefly to our listeners? Sure. So, yes, I am a um, professor at Transylvania University. Yes, uh, we actually recently adopted a bat as our mascot. Uh (laughs) (laughs) I was about to ask how often you get jokes. Yeah, we've we've just decided finally to embrace it, and I love it. Um, We actually have a long history of um, biologists. Um, Maybe you you guys maybe have heard of Raffinesque. He was a 19th century naturalist, pretty kooky. (laughs) <laughs> and he actually has a uh, he named a bunch of organisms including many that were already named so he's kind of infamous for that but <laughs> um, one is named after him and that's the raffinesque bat so that is our new mascot nice very cool <laughs> i mean it's 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 a good book to be to be referenced back to so i th- i think you guys should run with it <laughs> yeah <laughs> just just go with it <laughs> And Sarah also, the, the, the presence of Dr. Sarah Bray makes this another official podcast crossover episode. Yeah. As Sarah is one of the hosts of one of my all-time favorite podcasts, <laughs> Discovering Darwin. Yeah, it's a, it's a good one. Yeah, we've, we've been having fun with it um, for, I guess, a couple years now. Not as regular as you guys are, <laughs> but it's been, good, been a good time. First season was on The Origin, which we'll talk about a little bit today. And then this season, we've been talking about Darwin as an adventurer and, and mostly using The Voyage of the Beagle as our text. Yeah. Cool. Episode one of Discovering Darwin is like the best version of Spark Notes. Yeah. <laughs> mm-hmm. Yes. For going yes. through on the origin yeah. of species. It's it's super fun. We will have links all over the place when we put this episode up <laughs> for people to to check out your podcast. Awesome. The other thing that makes this a an exciting episode is that this is kind of our first holiday episode <laughs> yeah, yeah this is sort of the common descent holiday special <laughs> yes it is very much so this episode will come out on february 11th which is one day before february 12th that checks out which is charles darwin's birthday yay happy birthday yeah. Chuck. and that day is celebrated all around the world by dorky biologists (laughs) as Darwin Day. And we used to do all sorts of fun stuff at the museum for Darwin Day. Yeah, We even have a Darwin Day at the aquarium. Awesome. Ooh, very nice. Mm -hmm. Very cool. So happy Darwin Day to everybody out there. Yes. One more thing before we begin, a quick announcement before we get into the news, and then before we begin talking about the life, the science, and the man, Charles Darwin. (laughs) Man, the myth, the legend. The Man, the Man, Legend. (laughs) (laughs) This is the first episode of February. A reminder to all of our listeners that our monthly suite of episodes is brought to you in larger and larger part by (laughs) our patrons on Patreon. One of the rewards you can get as a patron is that we will say your name to the entire internet here on the podcast. And our latest bit of patronage comes from Nicholas Krantz who joined us like like five hours after we finished recording the last episode. (laughs) (laughs) Just missed missed being on the last one. So thank you very much for joining us, Nicholas. We appreciate it. Welcome aboard. Thank you. So with that, uh, all that that intro stuff done, 
Every episode, we like to explore some recent news on the topics of paleontology, evolution, life history, and such. Today, we have three news pieces for three people on the podcast. William? Indeed. Would you like to begin? Of course. I am going to go off off notes, off script, and I'm going to talk about a crocodile today. What? Uh, <laughs> you? Out of left field. I know you guys are all shocked, <laughs> but... There's a recent bit of news on some famous, actually modern crocs. These aren't fossil, but these, uh, the orange cave crocs that many of you may have heard of. Uh, they made the news a while back when they were first discovered in the earlier 2000s. Uh, there, 2008 was when they first were found in Gabon, Africa. Mm -hmm. And as their name suggests, they were crocodiles in a cave with orange skin. And they stood out for that reason. They've since from eating carrots, right? Yeah, yes. Oh, yeah, exactly. <laughs> I saw that Magic School Bus episode. And then they went inside and they found that the seaweedies are actually. <laughs> <laughs> so I had that one on VHS, so I remember. That. <laughs> but all of you people who weren't born back then are going VHS. Uh, um... <laughs> Ancient technology. <laughs> These Crocs, uh, they went back and took a closer look at them because they are really bizarre now these are african dwarf crocodiles or uh, west african crocodiles is what they're sometimes referred to as and mm -hmm. they're on the west coast of africa along a wide chunk they're not they're, they're pretty well known uh, above ground this population of cave dwelling crocodile is odd for one they're living in a cave <laughs> and that's not something yeah. crocodiles usually do and so they wanted to take a look they had noticed some differences between them when they first discovered and described this weird population so they wanted to identify whether they were genetically distinct you know were these a, a subspecies or other species of dwarf dwarf crocodile so they caught a number of individuals they said it was actually difficult to make sure they were catching new individuals when yeah, in a looking for them and this is the uh the in the uh abanda cave is the abanda cave expedition team uh, Richard Os Oslisi, Os Oslisi. I, you'd have I I can't. I, it's O S L I S L Y. Os Oslisi. Oslisi. Most Isley. Yes, right. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> it's Richard Oslisi was the person who originally discovered them, and uh, he and a number of other members on the team caught about thirty to forty individuals in the cave took blood samples, and then caught about 200 above-ground crocs and got samples from each of them. And then they sequenced the DNA from all these individuals to compare and with the intent of looking to see what stood out. And sure enough, the cave crocs have a unique DNA sequence called a haplotype, which Ooh. is a segment of DNA, a segment of genes that are transferred down by a single parent. And so... Right, right. So they're they, a separate branch. They have a slight difference. Now, they said this does not probably mean that they are a different species or subspecies, but that they may we, be, we may be catching them in mid-process of speciation, that they may be becoming a new species. If we were able to watch them for thousands more years, we may see that make them a distinct new cave crocodile. Very cool. Interesting. Yeah, it's, it's evolution in process. They're very similar to the above-ground crocodiles. They are a little bit different, which is also cool. Mm -hmm. They're a little broader, and these are already crocodiles with a fairly... They're known also as the broad snout crocodile. They're very small, uh, as the name dwarf crocodile suggests. They typically only get about six feet long. They found that the cave crocodiles were also getting at healthy sizes. They found one that was 1.7 meters long, so just shy of six foot. Mm -hmm. and that's big for this species, so they're not getting smaller in the cave. They are almost blind, which is to be expected. Yeah. Really? Yeah. Interesting. That's normal for cave animals. Yeah. And so they, they aren't utilizing their sight very much. Their orange skin, which they don't think is genetic, they actually think that's due to the urea from the massive amounts of bat guano, which is bat poop, <laughs> that they've been swimming in and living in. Because as they described it, there's this is a water-filled cave, and then all the bats, thousands of bats that live in there, the guano makes... They put a slurry. <laughs> yep, yep. Gross. <laughs> yeah, it's it's 
it sounds super cool until you're like, oh, oh, bad place to live. Um, <laughs> so they're like, they, they're like pre-tanned for you know yes. boots and belts and stuff. <laughs> yes. yes, it's it's we and this also affected their diet. They have they looked at the stomach count content. Crocodiles are not picky eaters. The above ground ones eat shrimp and crabs and frogs and snails and all sorts of other little animals. They're specialized for the smaller range of food in their ecosystem. The cave crocs are eating, not surprisingly, mostly bats and crickets and other mm-hmm. insects, but also they found a large amount of algae in their stomach. Hmm. Interesting. Which could be, bycatch is a fishing term, mm-hmm. but it could be accidental yeah. ingestion from eating something else and swallowing algae, but there have been instances of crocs taking fruit, so maybe they're adjusting to a, a weird environment. The two weird big questions with these crocs is... How are they getting in there and staying genetically diverse? Because mm-hmm. a small population would have genetic problems typically of not having enough to uh, keep disease uh, and and genetic deformities from taking over the population. Yeah. And they think maybe individuals are slipping in every few mm-hmm. generations, but they don't specifically know how they are getting in the caves. They also don't know roughly how long they've been in there, but they estimate a few thousand years because they say that they need a a few hundred generations to actually get that genetic diversity and crocs are fairly long-lived animals interesting and then the other side and this is one that i was reading it i was so caught up with them being a cave that it didn't even connect but how is a an ectothermic cold-blooded reptile surviving in a sunless environment yeah yeah and i mean even if they're not spending their entire even if they do come out at some point that's they're still going to be spending years at a time probably in perpetual darkness that you know, there's no no way for them to sit out and warm themselves because the cave's a steady temperature. And it's it's a lot of questions with these groups. This this research has not yet been published. Mm-hmm. They think it'll take a couple more years or a, uh, not years, a few more weeks to get everything lined up mm-hmm. and published and written out. But there's a lot more questions with this this unique population. I can only assume that the Crocs are staying warm. By bathing themselves in fresh <laughs> piles of fat. It's the the little the little endothermic bodies in their their heated <laughs> stools. It's like a spa. Yeah. Yes. A little Just fermentation a that warms things up. <laughs> yes, exa- that decomp that heat from decomposition. Yeah. It's it's so we I, if we could fast forward in time and I could see a truly subterranean croc species i'd be so happy oh boy it's like the morlocks of yes of that's exactly yes. what i'm thinking <laughs> we'd have the above ground peaceful dwarf crocodiles and then the underground morlock crocodiles what's really interesting to me about this study is that they mentioned that there you know it seems like there is a slight genetic difference mm-hmm. but there's a bunch of really interesting physical and behavioral differences mm-hmm. You know, the orange skin being a really interesting example of this is a population that may very well be on its way towards diverging mm-hmm. off, you know, in, in, a, in a different direction. But that orange skin is not part of a genetic characteristic of their mm-hmm. lineage, but an environmental characteristic yeah, of their lineage. Yeah, it's a lifestyle change. That... It's like flamingos. Yes, yeah. yes. Right, you're, you're picking up that color not from... Your, your genetics specifically, but just because of where you're living or what you're doing. I did a quick class on intro to paleontology at the aquarium, and one of the things I focused on was all the things that you don't fossilize and, you know, the soft tissue stuff. But that's another great example of that. If you were to show two people a correctly fed flamingo and a non-pigment fed mm-hmm. flamingo, mm-hmm. You, they'd assume, oh, those must be different flamingos. Right. Those must be different kinds. And so yeah. it's so there's so much variety that can change an animal. Yes. Also, all the work we do on fossil coloration is through pigment remains. Yeah. Which these crocs would not have nope. orange uh, pigments. <laughs> so we would not know that. It's cool that they might be um, eating algae, too. That's kind of a cool convergent evolution with, like, marine iguanas um, yeah. in the Galapagos. Yeah. Because that's pretty gnarly stuff to try to digest. So it would be, mm-hmm. you know, interesting to, you know, for a carnivore like that to go, not for fruit, that's pretty digestible, but to go for... You know, whether it's bycatch or not, you can imagine some selective advantage if they can they can use that as a resource. Yeah. Be interested yeah. to see if their uh, digestive content is any different if they're, 
you know, that their internal chemistry has adjusted at all. Yeah. Yeah. I spoke with a, a, a researcher not too long ago, Samantha Lee, who, who was specifically studying bonnethead sharks that not only eat mm-hmm. grass, mm-hmm. but are capable mm-hmm. of partially digesting it. Yes. Yeah, wow. It's the first sharks known to do that. Yeah. That's so, wild. E- evolution does crazy things. Absolutely. <laughs> Yeah, who figured that out? <laughs> yeah, right. uh, who came up with this okay. evolution thing? Uh, Sarah, you yeah. brought along some news. I did. Um, so this is a, a paper that came out this past week in the Proceedings of the Royal Society. And what it's exploring is this gap that we know to exist um, in the insect fossil record. So we're back in the late Devonian and we have some evidence of insects having arisen and then we go 62 million years with pretty much nothing until we hit the Pennsylvanian and so this huge gap has been a big question of why it exists it's been called the hexapod gap the insect gap Mm -hmm. and one of the big hypotheses about why that may have occurred is that um, oxygen levels may have been very low during that period Mm. and that that would have inhibited you know, the ability of those organisms to respire, to maintain themselves um, in that environment. So what the study sought to do was to kind of double check that, really look at what the oxygen levels were during this time. And uh, what I thought was really cool about this study is they really had a set of three alternative hypotheses. And as a scientist, you got to get jazzed when somebody (laughs) actually has alternative hypotheses. Mm -hmm. Um, So they had this low O2 hypothesis. Um, which uh, they tested by looking at carbon and sulfur isotopes. And what they found was actually that oxygen levels were not as low as had previously been um, determined. So we have a lot more data available to us to put into models to determine this. So they actually found that oxygen levels were much higher than they thought. And so it didn't seem like this could explain the paucity of 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 record there so the alternative they thought was well you know maybe we just don't have a lot of terrestrial rocks from that period of time nope check Mm -hmm. that out plenty of rocks running around we're okay Mm -hmm. there that's not it uh well maybe we've just undersampled so there's rocks but we haven't really sampled the rocks in that period and this was another kind of cool way where they looked at this was that they compared um pre and post this hexapod gap the um, number of fossils of spiders and millipedes, which are other arthropods, and found Mm -hmm. they are not undersampled. So there's no good reason to expect that insects were undersampled. So why? Why do we have this big gap? And um, these folks hypothesize that it is um, soon as we come out of this gap, we immediately see wings. And prior to that, insects... The, that we have in the record don't have wings. So mm-hmm. it seems like there's a great ecological explanation for this, that once wings come about, but prior to that, insects were at low abundance, rare to fossilize. We get wings, they diversify rapidly, and we get an abundance of um, insects in the fossil record. The, the other thing that I thought that was cool about this is this dealing with this oxygen issue. So um, I know you guys know about this, but I don't know if your listeners do, that there was um, after this hexapod period, correct me, I think it's the Permian, when, in which there were these giant, giant insects, like three meter uh, long wingspans. Does that sound yeah, right? Yeah, in the Carboniferous, Carboniferous in the Pennsylvania, okay. mm-hmm. Pennsylvania, right before the Permian even. Okay, right. So, mm-hmm. so right after this, basically. And one of the hypotheses there is high oxygen levels, right, that allowed for yeah. diffusion um, through these big, chunky bodies. And um, they actually lowered the estimated oxygen levels from that period as well. So, you know, one of the things is oxygen is maybe not the story to look for here. And maybe it's just these really cool ecological innovations like wings. Very interesting. That's really, that's a, that's a cool one. I, I like that because that, for two reasons. I've always been fascinated by the evolution of wings in insects because we have almost no evidence before we have fully formed wings, so it's such a mystery. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and it's it's cool to think that not only is that interesting as a mystery, but also the formation of wings was what turned insects into the winning design that they are today. Like everyone knows that insects are just yeah. everywhere, right. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and to think that there was a time where this design was not the dominating format 
is is a interesting idea and i, I also like it because it compares to like when eyes developed in the cambrian and we saw a, a, a huge russian arms mm-hmm. race evolution it whenever a body plan is what makes a huge shift is really interesting yeah absolutely yeah this this made me think of because you get a very you know the, the, this notion of having almost no insects and then lots of flying insects all of a sudden yeah. is pretty much the same thing we see with two out of the other mm-hmm. three mm-hmm. animals that have evolved flight. Mm-hmm. There are no non-flying bats in the fossil record. Mm-hmm. Yep, Bats show up and they're flying. Pterosaurs are the same way. Mm-hmm. We have no pterosaurs, and then we have abundant flying pterosaurs. And it really does... And, and both of those, and birds, and flying insects, are among the most abundant groups of animals. Mm-hmm. You know, yeah. Bats are, what, number two most yeah. abundant mammal group today? It's so, also one of the most abundant powers in superheroes. Yes, it is. <laughs> but <laughs> fly, yeah, once once the first superheroes yeah. of all flight just they just diversified like crazy. Takes it's, a Superman it's... started it and then they just shoo. obvious advantage. Yeah. <laughs> but it really does seem like wings are the kind of thing that once you get it, whatever the process was, that now you have a, a million and one niches to explore. Exactly. Exactly. It's it's a literal game changer. I mean, yeah, it, yes. Uh, it, you basically get to ignore the rules that so many other animals have to abide by. It's like, well, no yes. one can go up yeah. on that cliff. Well, I yeah. can. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Who's getting to that island? This guy. <laughs> yeah. yeah. I'm going to invite all my friends. Very cool stuff. Mm-hmm. One final piece of news. Now, I kind of wish that this was a news piece a month ago, because in our astrobiology episode, this would have been a cool news piece to mention NASA and fossils in the same <laughs> yep, yep. news piece. Oh, well. <laughs> it's, it's past justification. <laughs> <laughs> See, it, it is paleo-related. Yes. This is a news story. This is a, a, a new article that came out, just a scientific paper, describing a slab of sandstone with some of the highest density of fossilized footprints ever found in a similarly sized slab of sandstone, and it was discovered in a NASA parking lot. <laughs> Neat. Or I, it sounds like it was actually discovered in the hill next to a NASA parking lot. That was soon to also become another parking lot, I think. Or a building, yeah, it was, right? It was a building site. It was going to be a building. Mm-hmm. So this is on NASA's Goddard Space Flight Center in Maryland. An amateur paleontologist named Ray Stanford was exploring, look, looking around the hill near the parking lot, and saw this slab sticking out. People did some investigating, and it turned out that this is an eight and a half foot long chunk of sandstone, about two square meters total, that has approximately 70 tracks on it from the early Cretaceous period. Tracks are rare to begin with, so anytime you find fossilized tracks, it's exciting, right? A single footprint is an exciting find because they are rare things to find. Mm -hmm. Having this many, and not only are there lots of tracks, there's at least, the researchers infer, at least eight different morphotypes, at least eight different types of tracks, perhaps referring, uh, referencing at least eight different types of creatures. The study itself is out in Scientific Reports by Stanford et al. And I'm super happy to, to report that this is an open access article because they have a, a couple of images and diagrams of this slab of footprints that are awesome looking. Yeah. They really are. Super cool. As always, find that on the blog post. We will link to this. For some details, this slab includes... Footprints from what appear to be a juvenile sauropod dinosaur, so a young uh, version of one of the long-necked, long-tailed sauropods, a baby of one of the armored nodosaur dinosaurs, a handful of tracks that look like they are from a handful of small theropod dinosaurs, uh, the, you know, two-legged, mostly meat-eating dinosaurs, but these were small. Mm-hmm. These were the size of a crow or so. What's interesting about these small crow-sized dinosaur tracks is that there's a handful of them, which might be indicative of social behavior, Mm -hmm. which is very difficult to find evidence of through bones alone, and they're moving really slowly. You know, a lot of times when you get a full trackway, you can measure, you know, the the pace and how Mm -hmm. fast they were moving. 
these were, you know, moseying about on this, uh, in this sand, and the researchers infer that they may have just been poking around for food. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That these may be foraging tracks, which is really cool. Even cooler than that, and speaking of flying creatures, there are pterosaur tracks on this slab, which, by the way, are two words that I think, in combination in that order, are two of my favorite words in paleontology. Yes. Pterosaur tracks. <laughs> what? But alongside the pterosaur tracks, so the pterosaurs are the flying reptiles, uh, dear listeners, uh, besides those tracks, there are what might be marks from their beaks. <laughs> as they pecked around on the ground looking for food, which might be a very rare case of sort of a beak footprint, <laughs> like, a, like a feeding, like a trace left on the ground by feeding, which is really uh, cool. A face print. A face print. <laughs> <laughs> but probably the most exciting thing for the researchers, and it makes up a, a big bulk of the study, is that there are over 20 tracks from small mammals. Mm-hmm including at least three different ichnotaxa, so ichnofossils are trace fossils, and trace fossils get their own species names, a sort of species names, because you can't always tell if this footprint, you can't call a footprint Tyrannosaurus rex, because you don't know that it's Tyrannosaurus rex, yeah. so they get their own names. One of the types of small mammal fossil that they found were footprint tracks that are side by side in what appears to be a sitting position. <laughs> so this was a chunk of sandstone where little dinosaurs searched for food, pterosaurs might have searched for food, at least one tiny mammal popped a squat <laughs> in the sand for a little bit, there were bigger dinosaurs stomping around, there's a ton of really interesting information just in this relatively small, you know, like the size of me, maybe a little bigger than me, chunk of rock that was pulled out of a hill just in time to avoid having a NASA build a building on top of it. <laughs> it's a real life land before time. Yes. On their way to the Great Valley. Yeah, it's <laughs> it's a crazy amount of, of different kinds of tracks in a small space. It was so amazing to me in those figures that I hope all your listeners go look at to see mm -hmm. that, that they didn't, um, there wasn't that much overlap. So that was the other amazing thing was they had these independent, uh, footprints that they could really then get down in and analyze how many, mm -hmm. who, those kinds of things. Yeah, that was actually a good point that they made, which is that there doesn't appear to be, that that lack of overlap seems to suggest that a lot of these were not necessarily there at the same time, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. which is always super hard to tell with footprints is, were these two, was this, you know, a day apart? Was this a week apart? They reportedly said that they think that all these tracks were probably made within a few hours to a few days of each other, but not necessarily at the exact same time, mm -hmm. which kind of mm -hmm. makes sense because you've got predatory dinosaurs and tiny mammals, Yep. Uh, which may in fact, you know, may very well have been the kinds of things that the dinosaurs and pterosaurs were poking around for. Yeah. Mm-hmm. It's really, really, it's, it was also fun with the figure because the figures really are cool where they highlighted the tracks and showing it next to the stone. It's like the old highlights magazine getting to see that. Can you find? Because you would look and I'd go, oh, yeah, there it is. Sure enough. Yeah. Yeah. yeah I can. You can actually make it out. Like, it, it's really, really cool. There's what they had one that said crocodilian question mark, which was neat. <laughs> like, they had a lot of cool stuff in there. Yeah. There's also a, a couple of osteoderms from the notosaur. There are invertebrate remains. There is what appears to possibly be an ancient poop. Yeah. Going on the go. <laughs> this is just like the kind of information you get from these kinds of things that is not the sort of thing you can get from mm -hmm. straight fossil, from body fossils, from, yeah. from bones and teeth. So, And it tells you what was present in the area, mm -hmm. which we do not have a lot of fossils from this part mm -hmm. of the geologic record, which is very exciting. I thought it was really cool, too, that the um, first author and the finder of the find um, is an amateur. Um, and uh, once you once you sent the article to us, I, I took a deep dive in uh, looking up mm -hmm. some stuff about this guy. And um, I guess, you know, dating back to when he first actually discovered this, which I believe was 2012, 
they had been covering him and he's kind of eccentric. He's got his own (laughs) giant like barn filled full of fossils. And so there's all these museums courting him to try to get um, him to donate um, his, his finds to them. And he just seems to be like the, the track whisperer. (laughs) Yeah. He works for the Goddard center. Yeah. So this is a NASA person who, and I made this joke on Twitter, but I'll make it again here, who looked down for once <laughs> <laughs> and found these cool fossils. And it, it's always fun to see those people who are dabbling in, mm-hmm. I guess this guy's not dabbling. The The word amateur might be a misleading title for a guy that has a barn full of awesome yeah. fossils. <laughs> amateur is always one of those terms that, you know, gets denoted as a negative, but like there are amateur fossil collectors which all that means is that you're not doing it as your job. That's all yes. that term means, but it gets noted differently. But it's there are people who are, you know, a hobbyist in a subject that are just as well informed as the majority of professionals. They just work somewhere else yeah. and it's hobbies can matter. And it's really cool when because there's a number of fossils we've mentioned in the news before that were found by hobbyists or found by, mm-hmm. you know, uh, uh, someone who just knew enough to recognize what they had uncovered and became a big deal item yeah absolutely that is most definitely the subject of a future episode yeah i've thought about that <laughs> someday well there's the news folks so now let's move on to our big topic Woo. so today's big subject is our first episode about a person specifically and that person is charles darwin now darwin is kind of has this reputation as being the guy who gave us evolution, right? Sort of the he's synonymous with with the this the science of evolution. Mm-hmm. In fact, he presented us with the evidence of what the podcast is named after, Common Descent. Mm-hmm. Yeah. But of course, evolution was around as an idea before Darwin came about. Uh, he was not the first person to talk about this, and he was definitely not the last. So Sarah, being our resident Darwin expert. <laughs> Can you tell us a little bit about sort of, you know, what what was evolution before Darwin like and what made his contributions so unique? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So actually, thoughts about evolution go all the way back to the Greeks, if you can believe it. So um, Anaximander had some thoughts. Aristotle had some thoughts. some thoughts um really (laughs) the idea of the Aristotelian form is kind of a weird version of of evolution in the sense of think of a chair and matter joins with that chair and becomes different different things uh slightly different <laughs> versions of that chair and i think that's you know really a line that was picked up by buffon and he was a naturalist philosopher from the 18th century mm-hmm. and he's he's kind of famous for having studied elephants actually and had really hypothesized that the diversity of elephants found in the fossil record had to do with fossil mammoths migrating from the north south into southern Asia and across into Africa, and that the environment directly changed them. Oh, interesting. Yeah. So so that was kind of, you know, to me, one of the first truly scientific points of view of evolution. Mm-hmm. And then, of course, our own Charles Darwin's grandfather was interested in evolution. Yeah, Erasmus. And yeah, exactly. <laughs> cool names back then. And wanted to, to uh, was a poet nonetheless as well. So a doctor, a physician, and a poet and wrote uh, Zenomia, which was kind of his ideas about evolution coming up from the primordial ooze up to complicated organisms. <laughs> Uh, he didn't have a lot of evidence. <laughs> um, in fact, none. <laughs> but he did have the idea. And then, of course, probably whom just kind of jumping ahead to the person that probably people are most familiar with would be Lamarck. Yeah. And of course, mm-hmm. you know, Lamarck was famous for having the idea that, again, you could inherit acquired characteristics and that essentially striving yes. and and responding to the environment then would be passed down to your offspring and, and he had a very mm-hmm. directional mm-hmm. view also of evolution that life progressed from a low stage to the next stage and the reason why we still had 
in that point of view, all the low to higher life was that that process was continually happening. And, and that's right, what gave right. us that. Interesting. Lamarck also had ideas, if, if, I'm, if I'm remembering right, didn't he also have a whole set of ideas about intent like that that right. organisms mm-hmm. would evolve what they needed exactly that it wasn't yeah. it wasn't that some, yeah. a reactionary thing it was like if i think hard enough about yes. this <laughs> that's putting it you know flippantly but yeah that, that there was a will right uh to evolution yeah everybody always talks about the giraffes right yeah yep. yeah i was about to say the classic example is the the giraffes stretching right. their neck exactly yeah mm-hmm. it's that i i think the lamarckian one is an interesting because it's it's a a very forward thinking thing to say that it's a continuous process, but the idea that it's mm-hmm. progressive, yeah, upward ladder, progress, yeah. is still a a common misunderstanding slash yeah. misrepresentation of evolution today. Mm-hmm. Like the, I mean, I'm a huge sci fi fan, but almost every sci fi movie always this is a perfectly evolved yes. organism. <laughs> yeah, yeah, and, and it, they always they always portray it as You're like eventually you reach the end. <laughs> And then your epic tier, and your you, there's nowhere else to go. You're oh, you're yeah. the best, yeah. I and mean, that's why we have to kill you with you know, flamethrowers. <laughs> and and the, you know, and what, the what, you know. perfect version of organisms somehow always seems to stand on two feet and have a head yes, on the top exactly. and have two arms. Yep. Yes, they look very mm-hmm. familiar. Yes, exactly. <laughs> yep, it's, it's it's interesting to see that that thoughts you know been inherent in the the overall yeah. idea for yeah. a while yeah i mean linnaeus so, too right he had the whole uh scale mm-hmm. of natura that just in yep. the name there's a scale to it right um so it's yep. just been a part of certainly the western tradition i think from from the beginning to have mm-hmm. this idea of higher and lower yeah and then and then our friend chuck came along yeah exactly our friend chuck came along people were beginning to be more open, shall we say, to the idea of mutability of species. Um, and, mm-hmm. and that's the environment into which Darwin comes. And what really Darwin gave us, I would say, were two primary things that made the origin um, of species, his, his tome on the idea of evolution so important, is one, he gave us a mechanism. How mm-hmm. do these things change through time? And his mechanism was natural selection, that organisms overproduce. Um, they make more offspring than could ever su- survive, and that those offspring are going to be filtered out by the traits they possess. Those that survive due to those traits will pass them on, and thus we will get these gradual changes moving forward. Mm-hmm. So, so that was the really important idea that nobody had established. And then on top of that, he had a huge amount of evidence. He gathered a lot of data over really the course of, you know, close to 30 years by the time that he had published The Origin of Species. Oh, yeah. That's really cool. And The Origin, when you say he had a huge amount of data, it's it's like... Sometimes you have a huge amount of information and then you put the best bits in a book. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Darwin had a huge... It, it was like the, the Silmarillion. <laughs> yes, absolutely. Like, I'm going to put everything <laughs> yes. I possibly yeah. can. That I've ever thought about, measured. <laughs> mm-hmm. Yeah. The origin is fascinating, but dense. Indeed. Indeed. For sure. And he, if yeah. only there were some sort of podcast oh, you know, that I could think walk there you might through the chapters of the origin. possibly be one. <laughs> A chapter <laughs> by chapter discussion. In fact, <laughs> it's it's a it's a cool thing because connecting the overproduction of young to the develop you know, the the process of uh, developing new traits or selecting for current traits is is a cool one to me because that's mm-hmm. nowadays that makes sense that you know the survival of the you know the the ones that are surviving best continue on and the ones that don't move away but uh, you know before that i'm sure it was just like well yeah Uh babies some babies (laughs) die you know that's that just that just happens among animals yeah not all of us are going to make it to the to old age so actually making that connection is a it's one of those things that we all take for granted now but it had to be a major eureka moment when it was first grasp of like that that actually might be part of the mechanism that might that might work well even the variation that, you know, people would go out and they'd see, you know, that here's a bird and different birds looked different, even though they were the same species. There was the mm-hmm. thought of sort of the, the perfect mm-hmm. form. Right. And that the differences, the, you know, the fact that you had different 
finches uh-huh. that mm-hmm. looked not quite lo- that they were just mm-hmm. off. Right. That they, those were that was just a weird finch. Yeah. They're not supposed yeah. to look like they're supposed to look like the ideal finch. Right. Yeah. You just found a weird one. Yeah. Mm-hmm. As opposed exactly. to all yeah. of them are different. Yeah. And that there is inherent variation. Yeah. And and yeah. that variation becomes important. And I think that was, you know, he had a nice rhetorical strategy when he wrote The Origin in that he started with domesticated species. Darwin was a big pigeon mm-hmm. fancier. He bred um, pigeons <laughs> for these outrageous uh, traits. <laughs> and, I, and I think that was something that he was like, look, we've been doing this, actually. Human beings have been doing this for years. And there's mm-hmm. no reason to think that nature cannot also do this. Yeah, that it wouldn't just happen in, in on its right. own just yeah. over a greater period of time. The other thing that Darwin presented, and, and you correct me if I'm wrong, uh, but I think that he his work was really what pushed this idea forward, was the notion that not only do species change over time, but that all species change is part of the same lineage. Right. That once again, the name of the podcast, Common Descent. Exactly. And our logo is an is a evolutionary tree, which was also something that was Darwin mm-hmm. was the first one to draw one of those Absolutely. the way that we know them today. Absolutely. And when people talk about, you know, what did Darwin do and he you know, natural selection and that, you know, presented us with natural selection, he had a a, a billion pages of, of fascinating evidence. Mm-hmm. For me, the coolest thing about Darwin's contribution is that is yeah. this notion that Every living mm-hmm. thing, like in my room right now, there is me, there is a cat, and there is a snake, and there is an untold number of microscopic yeah. organisms, <laughs> and that we're all part of the same mm-hmm. tree, right. the same genealogy. That, for me, mm-hmm. I think is, is mm-hmm. the most fascinating scientifically and philosophically yeah. thing that Darwin put forward. Yeah. yeah, because there were some people at the time, again, that would accept the concept of evolution and would have this idea of, well, there's certain types that were put on this continent, and they kind of mm-hmm. diverged and became... So mm-hmm. they, they would take mm-hmm. this kind of small-scale evolution and descent, but not this global, hey, everything on Earth can trace back to one ancestor back there. Well, it's uh, going back to the bird example, because it's, it's an easy concept to be like, well, yeah, birds are all ob- obviously similar things, just slightly different version, you know, a stork and a sparrow... Looked, but they're both birds. Mm-hmm. We all call them birds, and so it makes sense that you could connect that to say, well, there's there there's bird, and then there's versions of it. But to be able to say yeah. there is yeah. life, and ver- like it's he he not only introduced some mechanism, but he introduced some heavy concepts that you know, as you mentioned at the beginning, underlie all Absolutely. major concepts of biology yeah. nowadays. And we can talk a little bit. We, we'll talk a bit more about his fan, uh, his life uh, and his his personal natural history a little bit later, but uh, he had what were some of the influences mm-hmm. and sources that helped Darwin to to come up with yeah. these ideas. So, mm-hmm. um obviously we'll talk more later I think about um the voyage of the beagle, but there were Darwin had a huge amount of correspondence both before, during, and after his trip on the Beagle. And he read a lot. There were some certain books that he pretty much wore out. And um, so (laughs) one of those people was Lyell, a geologist, right, (laughs) who really Mm -hmm. um, came up with the idea of uniformitarianism, the idea that these processes have existed and will exist and in slow increments change things. Hmm, sounds like something else we've been talking about. <laughs> um, so Lyle was important. Some of his uh, professors from when he was in Edinburgh also were important to him. Um, Hooker was a botanist um, who he corresponded with and became really one of his biggest cheerleaders um, and, a, and, a, and a, a scientific confidant, if you will, along the way. Uh, Humboldt, who actually was... Um, a century before and had had traveled and made a lot of observations really got him excited and then you know we've already mentioned this idea of overproduction of offspring and he read Malthus that was uh, really an uh, economic yeah. argument about humans <laughs> overproducing offspring and um, our food not keeping up with that production <laughs> <laughs> so um, he continued to have these um, correspondence with people Throughout his scientific career, um, he became, uh, he was always 
pretty ill um, in his later adulthood, and he was uh, was pretty much sequestered away at Down House, um, did all his own experiments there, but wanted things all the time and would write his, yep. you know, <laughs> his entire LinkedIn network to uh, get specimens and things <laughs> sent to him um, and to people to, to kind of do odd jobs for him projects and um, send him information or materials. Oh, yeah. Darwin would have made phenomenal use of the internet. Absolutely. Oh, yeah. Like, he would have had Amazon Prime. <laughs> yeah. He would have been on top of it. <laughs> exactly. And then there was Wallace. We want to, do we want yeah. to talk about Wallace a little bit? Not enough For, as he deserves, but just a little bit. Absolutely, yeah. So <laughs> uh, Wallace was another naturalist of the time, younger than Darwin, um, poorer than Darwin, ha yeah. had uh, done a lot of exp explorations. But when he was in uh, Southeast Asia, the in, uh, Indonesia really, caught malaria in a fevered state, <laughs> uh, essentially came up with the idea of natural selection himself as well and jotted off a fevered... A letter to Darwin, <laughs> who <laughs> received it and was like, oh, man, this is the thing I've been thinking about for 25 years. And this kid has my idea. What am I going to do? And he he wrote a lot of his scientific friends and really was, you know, what you know, what can I do about this? What should I do? He he did recognize that, that um, Wallace had the same idea. Uh, ultimately, his friends convinced um, him, and I, I, I don't, I don't want to say convinced him because I think he uh, agreed that Wallace's paper and a short abstract by Darwin would be read at the Linnaean Society together. So that, yeah. um, you know, you think about it, Darwin was rich. He was much more well known by scientists of the day. He could have just tossed that letter in the fireplace. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But he didn't. Um, and, and Wallace actually throughout the rest of his life he lived you know longer than darwin obviously he was younger always was very gracious and um, actually said that he was glad that darwin was the one that wrote the book because he didn't feel that he would have been up to the job interesting yeah that's one of those moments that that have been one of those, those um suspense moments in a a show or movie <laughs> where you don't you know you don't know what they're going to do next because it's that really is like wallace could have completely been like oh send it off to him and we'll see what he yeah. thinks and then just hear about the the, the article <laughs> later on <laughs> yeah right <laughs> damn you darwin <laughs> yeah. listeners if you want to hear an episode about wallace let us know yeah someday yeah. we'll cool be happy dude. to do that so darwin what, what i think is really exciting about talking about all these influences and all the stuff that came before him is that and this is another episode topic i'm sure but we have this we love to picture the the sort of lone ranger scientist, <laughs> right? That an idea pops out of nowhere and a scientist, you know, Einstein and Darwin and, and whoever else. Mm -hmm. As they railed against the scientific standard. Right, exactly. <laughs> they, they, yeah. they were like, you're all crazy. Look, relativity. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But, you know, Darwin was, as as a famous person once said, standing on the shoulders of giants. Uh, he mm -hmm. He just happened to hit on something really really important and mm -hmm. then wrote a giant book about it yeah well that's that's the thing that stood out to me when you were listing off the the influences and the the uh the other things that he was he was pulling from the other sources that he was pulling from some of these ideas is that they weren't all scientific writings right you know, some of them were yeah. dealing with other issues which is is cool this is just a, a slight personal but it's it points out the whole thing that Big ideas don't always just come from strict research, mm -hmm. scientific. You know, it's well-rounded yeah. mentality of you know a paper about you know economics, human and and human social dynamics of people having more kids than our production can mm -hmm. feed <laughs> has nothing to do with animal life history, right. but ha yeah. had enough of a chord there for him to go. You know what? The piece from that, and the piece from that, and the piece from that, and the piece from that actually come together to make a completely different picture. Yeah. Yeah. And it's it's that that's that's a really cool. This is a really cool example of yeah. that, and how uh, collaboration does not have to just be people within the same right. profession. And I, I think the other thing, this is actually something else that Wallace said was when he was given the Darwin Wallace Medal, um, was that the reason why he thought he and Darwin came up with this idea was because they had a, as 
Darwin had said an inordinate fondness of beetles that they were, <laughs> <laughs> that they uh, were yep. collectors that they were naturalists that they were widely read widely traveled um and i think you know this will be my little soapbox here is that i think we're <laughs> we're getting rid of a lot of natural history education in universities mm-hmm. and colleges and um i think it's some we really lose something that of course, DNA and, and molecular um, techniques can help us to learn interesting things, but without the context of the organisms, um, we really miss the picture. Mm-hmm. Oh, yeah. That, that well-roundedness yeah. is, is very important. Take, take humanities classes and study abroad, kids. That's right. Yeah, it's <laughs> all information brought into your horizon. So Darwin has his thing. He, he goes on his adventures. He writes his book. He is surprised by Wallace. What was the reaction like to Darwin? Obviously, Darwin's, you know, there's a reason he spent decades sitting on this book. Right. What, because there's also this, thing, you know, that, 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 that perception of Darwin as the guy who said, evolution, and then everybody right. in science was like, all right, of cool. Course. And then we, yeah. <laughs> you know, and then we discovered DNA next year. But that, yeah. no, there's... You have unlocked, <laughs> yeah. you have unlocked the theory of evolution. <laughs> yeah. yeah, it's like a sim game. Achievement. Yeah, it's like you've discovered evolution. Your great scientist yeah. was born. Yeah. So what, uh, what, what was the aftermath? Yeah, so it was uh, hotly debated. Um, there's great, you know, this is the Victorian era. And um, so there, there's just fun, like you feel like someone's going to whip out their um, glove and smack him across the face or something. <laughs> um, it, uh, it gets pretty raucous. And so Owen was a anatomist, paleontologist of the time, probably mm-hmm. the top scientist really in uh, the British Isles at the time. He hated it he absolutely (laughs) hated it he savaged it in a review interesting i have this quote that i think is pretty funny from um uh, sedgwick who was a geologist now he published this review anonymously which i think says something but uh, (laughs) (laughs) reviewer uh, number three yeah exactly we think everything's so (laughs) we think everything's so different with the internet now (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> he says, I cannot conclude without expressing my de- detestation of the theory because of its unflinching materialism, because it utterly repudiates final causes and thereby indicates a demoralized understanding on the part of its advocate. <laughs> so, wow, yeah, I, that's, th- man. I think I've had that comment in an article. Before on a yeah, review. right. <laughs> I've seen that comment on a YouTube video. Yeah. Yep. yep. <laughs> that's this is ridiculous and you're all stupid for thinking it. Exactly. Yep. Exactly. Yep. <laughs> so, so there were really two camps. There was that camp that hated it uh, for, on, a, on a scientific basis. Although I think, again, this is, um, you, you know, in that uh, quote that he, uh, unflinching materialism, I think that's something we wouldn't shy away yeah. from today. But at that time, mm-hmm. um, mater- you know, this, really the process of science was still diverging from philosophy. So there was kind of a little different feeling yeah um so so there were definitely people that hated it even lyle his bud that he would correspond with didn't accept all of it for like at least eight years and really to the end he didn't accept every piece of it but Mm -hmm. so there was definitely a negative camp there was a super go big we love it camp probably (laughs) (laughs) most famously um huxley who is known as darwin's bulldog Yep. Yes, because he basically went out on the circuit <laughs> and defended uh, Darwin. <laughs> uh, With his Darwin, Darwin t-shirt. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Darwin's like, yo, I'm just going to chill here in Kent. You got, you can go take care of this. <laughs> so, yeah, you know, uh, the camps formed pretty quickly. But within about eight to ten years, most people had gotten bored on common descent. Natural selection was still kind of some people going with it. Some people not. Um, and then, of course, there was... That, those were the scientists. Then there was broader social response, right. obviously, mm-hmm. to it. So, um, yeah, it's, luckily, those are all behind us. Yeah, yeah exactly. <laughs> not an issue. Uh, you know, it's not... The Creation Museum and Ark are not just up the road from me, another, you know, 30... 50. Yeah. So, yeah. We'll just leave that there. Um, <laughs> That's actually... It's an interesting comparison that I always thought that that always struck me, and you just mentioned it, that the idea of evolution and common descent caught on 
quicker mm -hmm. than the uh, the mechanism, the natural yeah. selection. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Which is interesting because these days, right, the, the most vocal anti-evolution sort of people from outside of science, right, mm -hmm. this is the social mm -hmm. uh, uh, peanut gallery, it is railing against the core, con the, the part that was taken to most quickly by the scientific community. Right. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And and you can correct or, or addendum, if I'm, but I, I know that there were a lot of people who, a part of the reason that it took so long for natural selection to be accepted or, or at least kind of catch on was that they they didn't have the mechanism of genetics right. to and mm -hmm. so there was there was a hole Absolutely. missing yeah. in it and people would point that out and be like yeah but how does that stuff happen yeah how how are you actually passing it on and so there was actually a legitimate scientific reason why people were being hesitant yeah, yeah. and on accepting that absolutely. it wasn't just stubbornness yeah. and darwin's like explanation of inheritance is totally off it's there's nothing right about it <laughs> um and oh, so yeah. it actually the way he argues it weakens his point and so yeah that that was that was pretty hard and until really we got to the modern synthesis with kind of the rediscovery of Mendel in you know 20s 30s 40s that was really finally when things kind of firmed up I would say locked in place yeah exactly that's I when I first learned about that you know in intro you know bio in college that to me i i never empathized you know more strongly with darwin than when i i had that moment of he had this amazing you know new new hypothesis you know soon to become theory that was pretty much right on the money and missing yeah. the critical cog yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you know it just no one knew that genetics existed and so there was no way for him to get that final answer yeah. that's it's that's a a very fascinating tragic yeah. tale. <laughs> yeah. And he never really saw it right. fully mm -hmm. embraced. Yeah. Mm -hmm. He sort of, he put it out there. The crazy thing is that um, he had Mendel's work in his library at Downhouse, but no one's mm -hmm. been able to really tell for, there are markings in it, but nobody's really been able to tell for sure if Darwin really read it. And you just think like, wow, what if he had, you know, that would have been a whole different, whole different story. Oh yeah, he had Chekhov's the... book. Yeah, right there yes. in his <laughs> in his study. That, that would be the the zoom in at the end of the yeah, the movie. Right. Yeah, exactly. exactly. They're like, the book. and then he died, never knowing the answer, and it just finishes on the zoom. <laughs> that's in not a movie. movie. That's a Twilight Zone episode. Yeah. Yes, exactly. That's <laughs> right, the Twilight. That, there was time now. <laughs> yeah. the, the thing. So Darwin as the evolution guy, obviously a big deal. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But let's also now talk a little bit about Darwin as just a person, right? This mm -hmm. was a guy who was born and lived and died and, and, and had a life. So let's talk about that. Uh, so Darwin was born to a, a wealthy family. Uh, we already talked about Grandpa Erasmus. And mm -hmm. um, his father was a very famous, very wealthy physician as well. And so he knew from pretty early on he was probably going to be okay as far as that went. Um, but his dad was pretty tough on him and was like, you got to make something out of yourself, Chuck. <laughs> <laughs> and so he, uh, he first went to college thinking, I'll be like dad and grandpa and my brother and I'm going to be a physician. And he washed out um, in a year. <laughs> Just hated it, got sick at all the you know, dissections, um, just was out. And his dad like, you got to do you got to do something. <laughs> so uh, he goes back to school again, and uh, now he is going to get just a, essentially a liberal arts degree with the goal of becoming a parson. This was going to be mm -hmm. the, the perfect, it was a respectable position for a younger son of a you know wealthy family. It also would give him plenty of time for the things that he really liked to do, which was to collect and shoot and ride and um, <laughs> basically geek out outside. So that was the plan. And uh, not, not only was Darwin himself from a rich family, but his mother came from another wealthy family in the UK, and that was the Wedgwoods, as in Wedgwood, China. Um, so <laughs> he, he often would yeah. <laughs> go visit you know, um, his aunt and uncle over there uh, uh, with the Wedgwoods. So he, he had a pretty, pretty sweet life growing up. Yeah, hang out with his cousin. 
<laughs> yes, yeah, we'll, we'll we'll come back to yes. <laughs> stuff later. Uh, so, uh, you know, he graduates from college and he totally is like doing what a lot of college kids like to do. He's like, I'm going to take a gap year. And I, <laughs> he had, time for sabbatical. Exactly. He had planned to go to Tenerife with some friends. He was like jazzed to go and the plans fell through and he couldn't go and he was bummed. But then uh, one of his professors, um, Henslow, contacted him and said hey you know there is this boat that is gonna go do some mapping and this guy Fitzroy wants to have somebody to have dinner with (laughs) and if you go (laughs) along you can be the naturalist and so you know Darwin was excited totally wanted to do this um had to try to convince his dad that this was a good idea yeah dad was thinking you're just you know wasting time not getting to your life and convinced his uncle, Josiah Wedgwood, to convince his father <laughs> to let him go. <laughs> yup. And this was the Voyage of the Beagle. And this was the Voyage of the Beagle. Yes. And so that, you know, was supposed to be um, about a three-year project. It ended up to be... A three-hour tour. Exactly. Yes. <laughs> yep. 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 <laughs> Every time. Uh, ended up to be five because Fitzroy was so fastidious um, about his maps. But of course, in that, that's really where he gathered all the lot of the start of his thoughts. And it's so fun to like, if you, if you, got, uh, you guys, your listeners haven't read it, uh, Voyage of the Beagle is so interesting to see these little snippets of you can see these ideas are coming to him. It's pretty fun. I wonder oh, if there yeah. was ever moments where the captain after the fact was like, you know, we... We also made some really important maps <laughs> on that exactly. trip. Well, it's actually, yeah, that's one of the things he got. Fitzroy, like, they had a falling out because they both <laughs> published yeah. um, books of the voyage afterwards, and Darwin's was a bestseller, and Fitzroy's Ooh. went nowhere. Did not know that. Fitzroy was also a hardcore, uh, 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 I don't, I, I'm missing the word here, but non evolution person. Yes, mm-hmm. yes. Like, mm-hmm. he, I think he gave a, I don't know if he gave a talk or if he just stood up in a room somewhere at one point and announced his shame yeah. in having helped to contribute to Darwin uh, uh, putting this idea out there. Yeah, it was, it was, it was a pretty bad uh, breakup. Yeah. Fitzroy, also the first person uh, to produce a scientific-ish style weather forecast. Yes, yeah. Oh, cool. Yeah, how about that? Yeah. We'll give him his own episode maybe someday. <laughs> <laughs> He's an interesting and very tragic guy, but... Uh, yes. Yeah. <laughs> um, so, so, yeah, so then Darwin comes back from the Beagle. He was ready to get back. And um, <laughs> another fun little Darwin thing was that, well, you know, it seems like now's the time to get married because that's what you do. And he has this great <laughs> to marry yeah. or not to marry list that he wrote out yeah, his pro con list yes. his like rory gilmore yes. uh, exactly. pro con list. it's the exactly. the friends episode <laughs> Ross <Yes. does> that. <laughs> not rachem <laughs> no, not rachem <clears throat> yeah it's great and there's that like one line in there that's something i won't quote it exactly but it's something to the effect of you know to have a nice soft wife by the fire better than a dog anyway <laughs> yes. it's, it's this very practical yeah. like like if you were in your room like all right i have to decide <laughs> if i'm going to am i going to to like and and you would just write whatever's yep. on your mind yep. And Darwin did that. Darwin wrote down everything all the time. And so you get his like Darwin stream of consciousness. (laughs) (laughs) So, but the woman in question was that cousin we were talking about before. Mm -hmm. Emma, Emma Wedgwood was his cousin. And they did, he did in fact decide, yes, I will marry. And uh, they married, they lived in London for a little while and then pretty much retired to Kent. It must have been a good marriage because they had 10 children. Um, and and they did seem to have a very close relationship. Um, one thing that's so weird about it and interesting is that they actually wrote. They're in the same house, and they wrote letters to each other in the same house. <laughs> interesting. I'm not sure if that's weird or adorable. I, yeah, right. Yeah, exactly. I guess we do that too, right? With significant others, you're texting them, right? Like, mm-hmm. hey, could you bring me the laundry downstairs? Um, yeah. <laughs> there's one a little more involved. Yep. And, and Did he have one of his pigeons just fly yeah, the letters exactly. downstairs and back up? <laughs> exactly. Got to got to choose the right one, the fast one. Uh, yes. Because <laughs> it, it would be even more awkward if it's personal delivery. Uh, yeah. <laughs> so, here, here you go. Read <laughs> you this. You could respond to this. <laughs> just, yeah, I'll be over here. Uh, <laughs> 
um yeah so uh, they they had a they had a good life um he never became the parson that he was supposed to his father passed away he realized even before his father passed away he when he got married he realized he would have enough income from his dad that he wouldn't really have to work and he never did uh, <laughs> um, yeah. he was a bum as just like his father was worried he would become <laughs> <laughs> what a failure and i think that's a really important point that darwin you know he he traveled around the world and he had great education and he had later in his life especially all the time in the world to write his books and correspond with people and he mm-hmm. had that because he was rich you you guys in one of your latest episodes you did uh, a quick oh yeah comparison the yeah to draw like the how episode. rich would he be yeah. and i'm trying to remember i the... think yeah so we had an economist from transy come and talk and i think he said like they would be the top 0.001 percent in terms of yes. richness something like wow. that I'm, it, i may be off by a decimal point or so there but ridiculously wealthy yes wow yeah. like like he was the son of of a person who was the equivalent right. of like uh, Bill Gates. you know <laughs> Bill D, big deal ceo kind yeah. of person yeah like yeah it's like crazy crazy rich so yeah darwin had you know this was at a time when if you can imagine such a thing uh science was easier yeah <laughs> if if you were well yes, off yes once again so glad we've progressed yes. <laughs> <laughs> we've left those times behind us i mean it's definitely better than it was mm-hmm. you know this wallace had a ton of troubles exactly trying to, yeah. trying yeah. to do the same thing because he yeah. he couldn't yeah keep up and this is exactly. this was a, a common theme and we we mentioned that in the the women of paleontology but a lot of scientists or notable scientists from way back when were the people who could afford to just go on long vacations and go to other countries yep. and not have to worry about you know working a job they could i'm just gonna go to africa for a month yeah, for, yeah. and I'll, I'll go back next year mm-hmm. and i'll just collect a whole bunch yeah. of stuff while i'm there because yeah. i'm interested in the subject you know so it was a lot of those things were happening because of people who had money absolutely yeah now in darwin's defense if i were super rich and had all the time in the world <laughs> <laughs> to do whatever I want, I think there would be a lot less book writing yes. and a lot more. <laughs> yeah, I think my productivity a lot more would not and... be the same. <laughs> <laughs> so he was a productive rich guy. He was a productive yeah. bum. Yeah, yes. absolutely. <laughs> uh, so what about Darwin's later life? You know, as he got later, you know, he did more science, and we'll talk about that in a little bit. But he also was. Uh, a bit more of a social figure and as he got older he obviously had health issues uh what can you tell us about darwin old man darwin yes darwin with the beard exactly (laughs) yeah so he was he was a bit of a recluse um he did not he did not participate really in society except through letter writing he was prodigious letter writer throughout his entire life um he did a lot of research on his own estate he had a lot of uh, he had a lot of land that he could do. He even um, got his kids to do research projects with him, participate. <laughs> so just like totally like take your kid to work from, you know, 19th century. <laughs> and yeah, I mean, after uh, Origin, he produced, well, his total life, he produced something like actual published books, like 25 books. Wow. And, and, you know, I couldn't even count the number of, of articles Oh, yeah. That he produced. And a lot of that that he did later in his life was things that he did on his own and just using his network to get him specimens, to get him samples, to get them to tell him, oh, yeah, this is what I found in this location. Uh, so he had a different, he was really good at using, I guess he was using people, <laughs> um, using people <laughs> throughout his yeah. career. Um, so early on in terms of getting position and getting feedback and later on getting younger scientists to send him information um, and, and participate that way. Yeah. Interesting. I think it was, and, and I, maybe you can confirm this, but if I remember correctly, one of your co-hosts, I think mm-hmm. it was James, but I could be wrong. Made a mention in one of the episodes of your podcast that the beard was a disguise. I, yeah, I think it was part of it because he was so well known 
at that point um <laughs> that he didn't want to be recognized incognito. <laughs> yeah because he would occasionally the only times really he would go out for the most part was uh, like away from you know far from the estate was he would go take you know baths uh, go to spas for his <laughs> for his poor health um and yeah that was part of the you know staying on the down low yeah, that's super funny to me because that's now the iconic image of Darwin yeah. Yeah. with the beard. And to mm-hmm. think that that may have been, uh, and I don't have any reason to distrust the word of your co-host, so <laughs> we'll take it as, we'll yeah. take it as, as being true. Mm-hmm. That, that he would have, that, that was his like antisocial, yeah. I'm trying to avoid people move. Yeah. It's, and it, I, I love stuff like that because it's, it's fascinating what we know historical figures for. And sometimes it's like, well, that was just. Like one person made that popular when they, you know, drew a portrait of them or something. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And then we all knew, we all run with it from there. So it's really funny if that, you know, that that's basically what happened with this sort of thing. If he eventually became known for that and it was not, it's it's, it's not nearly as iconic as people realize. Yeah. And that's, oh, <laughs> I find stuff like that hilarious. Yeah. Oh, yeah. That's like the, the people who knew me before I had a beard you know, versus the people who know me after both comment on it differently when they'll see me. They're like, oh, wow, your beard's ridiculously huge. And then I'll trim it down and other people will be like, what happened to your beard? And yeah, it's super weird when you shave your beard. Right? It? Yep. <laughs> like David, David knew me post beard. It's like, your face is naked. Well, Stop. Every time I go home, my grandmother goes, am I ever going to see your face again? <laughs> you must be Will's younger brother. <laughs> So another thing, of course, that Darwin did, and this is one of my favorite things that Darwin did, is that Darwin turned his abode into his personal laboratory. Totally. And just did all sorts of cool experiments (laughs) on his own at home. And a lot of them, he, you know, were part of his scientific uh, uh, investigations and publications later on. Mm -hmm. Uh, Can you tell us some of some of the work he did at home? Yeah. So one thing um, I would recommend to people. It's called Darwin's Backyard. I believe Costa is the author. It just came out like maybe six months ago. Um, That actually details a lot of his experiments that he does and actually sets Mm -hmm. them up for like, hey, here's how you can replicate them at home, which is pretty cool. So he did, you know, a lot of like growth experiments, even a lot of the stuff that's detailed in Origin, because, of course, that was like accumulated over 20 years of after he got back from um, the Beagle. He did different things with excluding um, grazers from places, um, basically had some of the first work on trophic cascades where, you know, if you rem- remove a predator and the, the the next trophic level down increases and that decreases the next trophic level down. <sighs> Cool. To a, a point where yeah. he talked about how uh, having more old ladies in the county would reduce the number of bumblebees because they keep cats. <laughs> <laughs> oh man, oh, it's it's like the the beginning of a beautiful mind where he's like I, I mapped out the mathematical equation of a, a mugging. <laughs> That's awesome. Yeah. So, so yeah. And, and he had, and I think, um, David, you've been there. He uh, had the sandwalk that he would walk on. So he would do his studies. Yes. He would do his readings. But then he'd do his thinking while he walked around this sandwalk. Yes. I have walked in the footsteps of the path that Darwin took while he thought his big thoughts. And my big thoughts were, wow, I'm never going to have big thoughts. <laughs> Not like Darwin. <laughs> this was, yeah, if you can actually go, dear listeners, if you go to Kent, which if you are uh, in the same country that we all three are in, is a bit of a trip across the <laughs> pond. Uh, but Downhouse is where Darwin lived for a good chunk of his life, and they've turned it into a bit of a museum. And you can go through and, and learn all sorts of stuff about Darwin's life. You can walk the, the sand path around his property. And at least, if they, as long as they haven't changed it since I've been there, you can buy carnivorous plants yes. <laughs> that they sell outside the door. Because <laughs> he, he was a big fan of, of carnivorous plants. Yeah. Well. He did a bunch of work on those. Yeah, that's, that's one of his be? books. Um, he wrote one on orchids he wrote one on earthworms um he wrote mm-hmm. one a two i think it's a two volume series on barnacles you know that one is a page turner wait for that on discovering darwin <laughs> <laughs> wow. barnacles were the like he wrote he was like obsessed. literally wrote the books yes on barnacles yeah. he spent years and years on those yeah for real it's that's love man <laughs> it's, 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 it's he had such specific and eclectic interests and it's 
it makes him re- it's like you, you really wish you could just see what it was like to do or just to be able to interview a friend would almost be yeah. more interesting than interviewing him it's like what what's your take on darwin yes, exactly. <laughs> yeah. well his kids got involved like sarah yeah. said there's a famous i think it's the who what's the organization that's been putting together darwin's works is it the am and h is you know, it the American Museum that's been doing I mean, that there's a there's a Darwin online that we use a lot, and I think it's a UK group, but I don't know who does who does it. Okay, but there are there there's projects that are digitizing yes that Darwin's yeah. works oh, and gotcha. memos and things like yeah. that. And I remember one of those had posted a picture I think recently of one of his works that had had a bunch of his notes on the front and on the back were doodles from his kids. Yes, yes, <laughs> yes. Aww. That got into his office yes. or however they got a yes. hold of it. Yeah, there's like the, the vegetable wars or something like that. Like soldiers yeah, yeah. eating vegetables. <laughs> <laughs> it's great. That's awesome. One of my favorite of Darwin at home stories, and I mentioned this in episode four, which was Island Evolution. Yep, yep. When we were talking about dispersal. Mm-hmm. And oh. Darwin was... was yes very curious about this question of how if right he had these idea right it, in order for species to get to an island they weren't planted there they have to get there somehow mm-hmm. so his question was how do they get across the sea and he did all these experiments where he would can a seed survive right if i put a seed in seawater for 10 days 20 days whatever whatever if i put an egg he would test these things the best one is he was curious he, he wanted to know if birds could carry mm-hmm. creatures yep to new land masses. Yeah. And one of the experiments he did was, and if you have any more details on this, Sarah, feel free uh-huh. to jump in. But I guess he put a call out to his many yes. contacts for somebody with bird feet. Yes. <laughs> Someone who could send him, I think they were duck feet. Yes. Is that yep. what he ended mm-hmm. up with? Yep. And he submerged them in water with snails in it to see if the snails would grab onto the feet. And turns out they did. And then his next question was, can they hang on during yes. flight? <laughs> and so in typical Darwin science fashion, he waved the duck feet around <laughs> in the air over his head to see if they would hold on. Yes. <laughs> Turns out they do. They do. <laughs> <laughs> so just all these wonderful at-home investigations. Yeah. It, it's, it's like at-home Mythbusters of him just going, huh. And <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> let's find out. <laughs> That's fantastic. So what were some of the other works that he did yeah. later in his life? Right. So he did The Origin, right? That's his fam- yes. famous one. But Yes. And then Barnacles, I think, was at least partially before that. Right. He was working on yes, Barnacles. Yes, exactly. Yeah, those were before. Earlier on. So he did, um, one of the kind of cool books that he did was about uh, history of uh, human emotions. And it was one of the first books to have photographs in it. And so he had oh, all these photographs made of different people, different ages, different ethnicity, eth- ethnicities expressing emotions and was trying to kind of make an argument about that as also something founded in the commonality of descent. That was a pretty cool one. Um, he wrote books on fossils, on coral atolls, the formation of volcanoes, um, geology. Um, of course, the yeah, the famous uh, orchid book, there's another one on insectivorous plants. Um, the last book he wrote was on earthworms. <laughs> and that's a pretty fun one uh, to read that, you know, he, he gives a lot of props to the earth. I like, you know, I kind of I dig Darwin in that he went for the kind of what might seem like the underwhelming species <laughs> or groups. Yeah. That's yeah. what I was. I was thinking the exact same thing yeah. is that he's like, oh, you understudied taxa come here yeah all unanswered questions Mm -hmm. look at this worm a million questions we don't know the answers to right and you know probably his most famous book after origin was descent of man and Mm -hmm. and this is you know in the origin he makes a very veiled passing reference in the very final chapter chapter to say and this might apply to human beings (laughs) and he really develops it in descent of man and and also develops the concept of sexual selection 
And it was pretty, I mean, well, it was a Victorian area, so anything sexual is pretty risque. But uh, (laughs) on top of it, you know, he talked about females choosing, and that was rather scandalous, this idea. It was way too uh, forward and aggressive. Oh, my. (laughs) Women having choices. Yes. Ideas in those pretty little heads of theirs? No. (laughs) Interesting. Yeah, Yeah, he he was a controversial figure. In yeah, a lot of ways. Absolutely. He didn't want to be, I think. No, I don't think so. And he was, he, well, I think he was always, he was always concerned about how he was perceived. Like you look at these letters, like you said, they've digitized um, a lot of his letters as well. And you look at them and he's really worried about what people think of him. And that's especially you know, right after Origin, he's sending it to, to Hooker mm-hmm. and Lyle and Asa Gray in the United States. And like, what are people saying about me? Uh, so, yeah, he was, especially early on, he was really worried about his scientific credibility. Yeah. That's interesting. It's really interesting from that standpoint that he he was not a, like, active social public figure, but just by saying, by, by making observations, he was, you know, becoming so. Just, right. you know, through, through the act of going, oh, I, have any of you ever noticed this? And then everyone responding. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> yeah but you're wrong. <laughs> <laughs> yes. <laughs> so as we sort of wrap up our discussion for this episode, one of the things that I, th- you know, I think is really interesting about Darwin is that level of fame, right? As we've been talking about, he didn't aim for that, really. He didn't even particularly enjoy it mm-hmm. uh, mm-hmm. all the time. But now he is this like if you ask people like who would who would be the su- the, the science uh, uh, super friends mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. right Dar in fact I think there's a video game there, that there, is that and Darwin there actually is. there's a there's a, there's an animated series also That's on YouTube it. that yep. yes he is <laughs> so my question to to pose to you Sarah mainly does Darwin deserve his iconic status that that we treat him with today. Well, I'll start with clearly you guys asked me on because I'm a total fangirl. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely, yeah, we've seen we plant, so, you're a plant in our podcast. <laughs> um, look, I, I think clearly the foment was there that, that someone, I feel like evolution and natural selection, common descent, these are such core, crucial ideas that someone would have happened upon them. But... I think Mm -hmm. that Darwin was really the kind of guy that you had to have to do it. He was both cautious and, but wanted to make a name. He um, was incredibly um, conscientious about getting data. I mean, the the fact is he waited, you know, from, he first wrote kind of an abstract of his idea in 1842 about common descent and, you know, origin wasn't published until 1859 that was a lot of time where he was just sitting on this Mm -hmm. idea so um yeah yeah, i I think he deserves um the hype but i'm actually curious because like we said i'm a fangirl i want to hear what you guys think (laughs) (laughs) i it's one of those where i i think it's easy to inflate historical figures you know and into like you said with like a scientific figure justice league but just historical figures in general we we like to sum them up into the thing they're well known for and uh, attribute all things having to do with it to them and it's easy to overlook stuff but i i do think with this case with darwin it it was kind of it's uh like one of those critical mass moments of the a lot of the ideas or parts of the ideas were there and this this idea was not it's not like we said it's not like everyone was saying we all came from rocks and that's it. And that's, you know, we weren't just stuck in this one way. And then he came through and having to fight and tooth and nail to get this idea. It was at the right time for this idea to be coming in. But he put the pieces together in a way no one else, you know, uh, 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 you know, mostly no one else had really done. And he put it together with such a background of, of knowledge that at taking 25 years to put together a, a thesis is a, a ridiculous amount of time. <laughs> regardless like today people don't follow a single study for 25 years so that's that's an impressive amount and it's one of those without all of those things you know who knows if we would have would be where we are today on that subject or if it would have taken a lot longer to put the pieces together 
And so it's it's definitely it's a notable moment, and I I feel like it definitely it's he he definitely deserves acknowledgement for that that change that that uh that moment of realization and for the scientific community. Yeah, I would agree with that, and I think that you know I I think that the, one of the dangers of having a have having rock star scientists mm -hmm. is that you know you put someone up on a pedestal. Mm -hmm. Darwin was not a perfect person. Right, mm -hmm. there, he was a person, and he famously held some ideas of his time that may not have been, you know, he was a wealthy white dude in mm -hmm. England in the 1800s. In other ways, he was very progressive scientifically, maybe even a little bit socially. I think that what really stands out for me about Darwin, and this you both touched on this, is that he really was an exemplary scientist. Mm -hmm. You know, I don't if we're holding Darwin up as a role model, I don't even care about his personal life as, mm -hmm. you know, as a scientific role model. This guy took more notes. Like if mm -hmm. I started trying mm -hmm. to catch up to Darwin now, I would not catch up yeah, to him. No. And mm -hmm. he was, he, he just was extraordinarily detailed. He was very thorough in his research. He, he had all sorts of contacts and support scientist helping him and collaborating with him he really did an extraordinary job at the science that he that he worked on and i think it you know because you have people who have a new idea and i i did this this experiment i did this study and that's really great and it always pushes the science along mm -hmm. i think it's a testament to darwin that his idea spent that after he presented the origin of species Decades went by of people trying as hard as they could to tear it apart, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. as any as, as as is the fate of any scientific mm -hmm. publication. And when the dust cleared, an astonishing amount of his original ideas were intact. Yes, yeah. He put in the work, he put in the effort, and he really did, you know, make a, a lifetime's worth of discovery and contribution to this field. Mm -hmm. And he spent a lifetime doing it. Mm -hmm. So yeah, I think I think that. I think that as a as a an example of a of of a great scientist, yeah, I would say yeah. so. Dear listeners, if you agree or disagree, feel free to let us know after you've heard this. Get in touch with us. Uh, we'd love to hear some perspectives. A couple more things that I ca I wanted to ask. These aren't on our outline, so I'm surprising Sarah uh, okay. with these questions. <laughs> uh, in the interest, uh, it is it is Darwin Day tomorrow, or listeners, whenever February 12th is in relation to the day you are listening to this. If people want to learn more about Darwin, you know, once again, we end every almost every episode by saying we could talk about this yeah. forever. <laughs> there are books and books written about this man. Yes. Uh, Sarah, do you have some favorite resources about Darwin? Sure. Um, so I think, t t um, to me, the best biographer, if that's what you're interested in, of Darwin is Janet Brown. She's a great historian, a lot of research. She has several different books on Darwin. I like that one a lot. Um, if you're interested in reading the origin yourself, I would recommend there is an annotated version by James Costa of the first edition. Um, I've used it when I teach classes before because it can be kind of hard to get around the Victorian language in Darwin. <laughs> and yeah. so it's nice to have <laughs> the context and um, some interpretation there. That's another um, great one. Um, let me think other um, good stuff I like about Darwin. Um, Oh, I know. Uh, Desmond Moore has, um, the, he and, I'm not going to remember his co-author off the top of my head right now. Um, they've also done a lot of stuff on Darwin. There's an, they've written a nice companion for the Beagle. And then there's another really interesting, David, you kind of brought this up in terms of what was Darwin's social um, uh, progressiveness or lack thereof. And they've written one about Darwin's relationship with slavery. Um, that I think is um, okay. a, a, a pretty interesting one. Um, he, yeah, he. I have mixed. <laughs> I have mixed feelings. If you read the Beagle, there is some tough stuff to get through um, in terms of of race <laughs> in that one. So uh, he was a man of his time for sure. Oh yeah, <laughs> and all these things that you just said, we will provide uh, links in our blog post as Excellent. we usually do. Yeah. Uh, I do not have as many references as Sarah does, of course, <laughs> but I will recommend two, besides Darwin's writings himself. Right. 
uh, the only biography of Darwin that I've ever uh, read all the way through is The Reluctant Mr. Darwin, mm -hmm. which I found to be very delightful. I learned a ton about Darwin. Uh, that biography very pointedly skips the beagle. Mm -hmm. There's the whole approach, as he says, we're going to talk about everything but the beagle, because yeah. everybody's <laughs> writing about the beagle. <laughs> and then my other reference about Darwin is a podcast called Discovering <gasps> Darwin. <laughs> which that was gonna be stars, mine. <laughs> <laughs> uh, which stars Dr. Sarah Bray and her two esteemed co-hosts. Seriously, though, uh, the the reason that Sarah came to mind when this when we, when we saw this episode topic suggested is because Discovering Darwin is a cool podcast. I'm not just saying that because she's here. You have no choice. <laughs> <laughs> Highly recommended. Uh, to go check that out, and we will have a link to that in our blog post as well. Mm -hmm. On a final note, uh, and this just occurred to me, so if you have a response, uh, Sarah, do you have a favorite Darwin quote? Oh, so uh, my favorite quote of Darwin actually comes from the last uh, paragraph of On the Origin of Species. And uh, he says, there is grandeur in this view of life with its several powers having been originally breathed into a few forms or into one. And that whilst this planet has gone on cycling on according to the fixed law of gravity, from so simple a beginning, endless forms most beautiful and most wonderful have been and are being evolved. Yes. 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 Something about endless forms most beautiful was a candidate for the title of this podcast. Ah, uh, yes. Mm -hmm. and, and we scrapped it because everyone and their dog has, has used that. Yes, exactly. <laughs> yep. it's, it's such a great and iconic Darwin sentence though. absolutely yeah he can he can turn he can turn a beautiful phrase when he gets it in him <laughs> yeah yep. <laughs> yep. well and it, it, it hits on a, a, the cool concept of that th things working under the base mechanics that run the universe can create awesome stuff exactly like yeah. it's it's a simple set of rules that everything functions by and the complexity still creates awesome things. That's really cool. <laughs> Along those lines, actually, the reason I thought of that question is because I have a favorite Darwin quote. <laughs> now, it, realistically, I should have let you go second because yours is the end of the book. Mine is from <laughs> earlier in, on the origin of species, but I will share it with our listeners. And this is similar to what Will was just saying. This quote, and I do not know what chapter this is from because I did not write that down when I wrote this in high school <laughs> on my Facebook page. <laughs> When we no longer look at an organic being as a savage looks at a ship, as at something wholly beyond his comprehension, when we regard every production of nature as one which has had a history, when we contemplate every complex structure and instinct as the summing up of many contrivances, each useful to the possessor, nearly in the same way as when we look at any great mechanical invention, as the summing up of the labor, the experience, the reason, and even the blunders of numerous workmen, when we thus view each organic being, how far more interesting, I speak from experience, will the study of natural history become? Mm -hmm. Absolutely. I love it. Yeah. He even has that reference to savages, which goes to what Sarah was yeah. saying about <laughs> his questionable <laughs> viewpoints. <laughs> yep. That's, that's, that's awesome, though. See, now, now I need to actually read. I'm a slow reader, so now I need to actually read through the book and find my own favorite <laughs> I did. I, I did. This was a, a question that I just thought of, so Will did not have time to prepare. I apologize to Will. I'll get there. I'll get there. We'll be, we'll be on our random Birds of Prey episode. I'll be like, by the way, <laughs> go back to episode ever. 28. In case any of you were wondering still. <laughs> well, friends, I think we have... Uh, reach the end of our episode today. Mm -hmm. I would like to thank, as always, our listeners. Thank you, everybody, for listening. Thank you to our patrons for your support. Thank you to Dax for making this suggestion that has led to a wonderful episode. And the biggest of thanks, wherever you are in the world, a round of applause for our very special guest, Dr. Sarah Bray. Thank you so much for joining us on this episode. Thanks for having me. This has been a lot of fun. It's been a pleasure. Thank you. This has been excellent. As always, dear listeners, we release new episodes of the Common Descent podcast every fortnight. So two weeks from the day before Darwin Day. Keep an eye out for episode 29 coming up. 
every episode there is cool links and photos on our blog, which we will fill out in time for the episode to go out. We are always taking your suggestions and your comments and your feedback on social media and on iTunes and on your Gmail, commonsendpodcast at gmail.com. However you want to get in touch with us, we love to hear from you, especially when it supports awesome collaborations like this. Uh-huh. Yeah. And I think that's it, everybody. Have a happy Darwin Day, everyone. Mm-hmm. Happy Darwin Day. <laughs> Go catch a beetle. <laughs> Go catch a beetle. There is... There is a picture of Darwin that I guess one of his friends drew. Yes. When he was, you know what I'm yes. talking about. When it's Darwin on a giant beetle yep. Yep, yep, yep. holding a net, yes. and it says, Go it, what does it say? Go it, Chucky, I think. Yeah. yeah. Underneath it. And when I was in Bristol, in England for SVP in 2009, there was, I don't remember where this was, but outside of some building, there was a statue in the shape of a giant beetle. <gasps> And I got on top of it, and I sat upon it, and I put my hand in the air, and my friend Dan took a picture of it. That's awesome. <laughs> and I am 100% certain I was not supposed to be sitting on that statue. <laughs> <laughs> but I have that picture somewhere. It was my homage to, Ch- to, to, to good old Chuck. That's awesome. <laughs> nice. All right, guys. That's that. <laughs> that's a wrap. We will see you for the next episode. See you around, everyone. Bye. <laughs> Thanks for listening to the Common Descent Podcast. For more from us, you can follow us on the Common Descent Podcast Twitter account, Facebook page, or on our WordPress blog where we post additional cool stuff for each episode. The song you're hearing is called On the Origin of Species by Protodome. You can find this and other video game remix music at ocremix.org. Thanks again for listening. We hope to see you next time. Oh,